Yeah, because I saw those. Do you want me to go ahead and record this? Are you guys talking or? So I pretty much was, um, the mail was delayed probably four months from the time that the bank had sent it. By that four months, I was already back stateside, and the bank had uh, sold my house already in an auction, and my stuff was in the locker, and was, here's your locker key. You owe us this much for the locker rental. So. What, if, are you comfortable talking about what happened in Afghanistan? Like, about what? Like, about what you saw? What do you think America represented over there? Nothing good. Honestly, nothing good. Um, a lot of the stuff that we're getting told to do is war crimes. It's all a bunch of war crimes. It's, okay, well, let's go kick in this door to this house and let's, you know, take over this house and use it as our as our intelligence point and then we're going to start spreading out. You know, so we just place a family, an Iraqi family and, or an Afghani family and put them into another home and, you know, That's not the way it's supposed to work. So. And someone got rid of your house when you were there? <coughs> yep. Or where are we now? So do you think what we did over there was justified? No. Um, it's all, you know, at first I was like, you know, they were, when the war first started, they were talking about going to um, war for, for them attacking us on 9-11 didn't go after the right person. We just landed in, in our country and said, okay, well, we're going to start from here and work our way out. We didn't, you know, strategically do anything. You know, they pretty much were like, here's the country, we're going to take this over because they have the most oil right now. You know, we'll take over and we'll act like we're going to give it back to them with democracy and then we're going to still police it. You know, like I got buddies that are, they said the war's over and we're pulling all of our troops out. I got buddies that are still over there that probably won't be out anytime soon. You know, they're working on nine months right now. What do they think is going to happen when they come back to America? Who knows? I don't know. Some of them, some of them came back. One of them came back to Sydney Lake. One of them, you know, just really messed up and still you know, wars are over there. But it's like President Obama just kind of shut it off to everybody. You know, and they didn't. Do you think they should be charged with war crimes? The president or just the generals? And the General, high, everyone. Up? somebody should have to pay or be charged with some of those crimes that we're committing to protect freedom. You know, everybody has rights in the world, not just the United States, but the fact that we're going over there and killing innocent people to, it's like Vietnam all over again. We're going over there taking people's houses, killing them, destroying their lives, telling them, okay, you know, we're no better than Saddam Hussein if we go over there and say, you're, you're going to do this now. Coming to the foot heels of them saying you can't do this, you can't do that. And now it's America saying you can't do this or you can't do that. It makes us look better. So all we do is take calls. The military just takes calls. I mean, that's that's the gist of some of it. I mean, there is like some other intelligence stuff that I'm not too comfortable talking about. But, um, 
I'm, as far it's as, hard to ask these questions. I'm just gonna. As, as far as as far sorry. as like some of the missions, there's there's missions that happen that are, are secret. You know, you just don't talk about it, and that's where some of the war crimes come in. Some of those missions, you know, every we don't get a mission without it coming from one of the higher ranking officers, and that includes, you know, it kind of has a trickle down. You know, the president has to to look over. You know, say, okay, well, this is our objective. Generals will get it, which is passed down from command to command, you know, until we get it, we get the mission, and then we do it, no questions asked. You know, and then somebody has to, whoever originally sent out the order needs to be charged with the order. They can't just let this sort of thing, you know, we're going over, we went over to, to Iraq and invaded their country and took out their leader because he was committing war crimes. Right? Are we doing the same with our leader? Sanctions imposed upon the U.S. Certain corporations. Yes, very much so. A lot of the corporations are funding, you know, the United States military. Um, a lot of them are just buying oil. You know, a lot of people are just a lot of companies are buying oil. And that's, you know, and that's where it's becoming a problem. Is the world powers are starting to buy up more oil, and the United States is one of them. And it's <laughs> it's becoming a major problem when gas goes up. You know, from being 1999, like two, like a dollar, two dollars to five dollars, and ten years later, you know, less than ten years later, it goes up almost three dollars in price. Do you think it's an individual's responsibility to cut back on consuming oil? Um, I think there, part? I think there's ways to cut back on oil. I mean, oil, oil and gasoline are, are a big part of, of America because of cars that everybody can afford. You know, thirty thousand dollar all electric Nissan Leaf hybrid vehicle, you know, an alternative fuel vehicle. If the government was more willing to work with people on, okay, well, you know, you can pay, you know, we'll, we'll only charge you seven grand because you're saving the environment. You know, my church is 30,000 and then, and then, you know, it, they have to pay more money and by the time you get paid, done paying that 30,000, the car is obsolete. It's no longer, there's a new car out there, you know. There's a new car, there's, there's new technology out there and vehicles, you know, I mean, they're start coming out with self-drive and as far as using oil and gas they're just burning it up like we like we have a unlimited supply so do you think that as individuals like we can change and, and help and not go to war do you think that's like what could I do every day in my life to cut back on oil do you think that would change if what if I didn't drive that extra 20 miles or if I took the light rail or yeah. I walked to the store do you think that would help with the war issue I think it would because we wouldn't be so it's supply and demand. You know, if we, if we don't have the demand for it, we don't need to go invade a country for no reason and take their supply. You know, and if if we are all taking light rail, we're taking public transportation. You know, it's ridiculous that that we have to pay ten dollars to get on the bus. You know, the prices are going up. It's ridiculous. If there wasn't the supply and demand, we wouldn't have to pay for the oil prices rising. You know, for on the buses, and the buses are supposed to be alternative fuel anyways. Nitrogen alternative propane, stuff like that. Propane shouldn't be that expensive, you know, but apparently it's going up in price for some reason. Uh, you know, and everybody started taking buses and walking and, you know, riding bikes. Ride bikes? I mean, it would save so much money. And How many lives? Did yeah, it would save lives. I mean, I, I was in a car accident six, six months ago, you know, and it's like ridiculous because she was texting on the phone driving and failed to stop at a red light right over my vehicle because she was texting me. It's like, lady, come on, you know, it's like, you know, she wouldn't, if, if one, if she wouldn't have had any gas or, any, you know, or any anything to run her car on, you know, or she would have been on a bike, it would have never happened. She wouldn't be getting sued right now for her, for injuring me. And I'll have to deal with the injuries for the rest of my life. I'll never be completely healed from it. You know, and post the traumatic stress that I went through with that accident, you know, not knowing what happened, waking up and then, it's just, Herself a whole lot of money, and her insurance could have made a whole lot of money if she um, did it. Uh, <laughs> did it the right way. You know? Did you, when you were over um, in Afghanistan, did you, when you came home, did you suffer from PTSD? Yeah, I, I suffered from it. Um, I was back probably. I had been back a while. I had lived with a girlfriend at the time, and uh, she sat up down on the bed. This is one of the incidences that happened. She sat down on the bed, and I slept with. This is, you know, for 
protect, you know, like in, in American soil, and, and I still have the mentality that, okay, I'm over there, I'm still over there, you know, she sat down in the bed, I mean, someone would come in and try and hurt me, you know, and I felt really bad for her, and they didn't diagnose me until just recently, but I was like, what the hell is all this stuff happening, you know, and I never really, I was always in denial that, okay, I don't have it, it's their line, you know, I never have it, I'm, I'm a tough mental person, you know, I'll never have to worry about it, you know, stuff that I've seen and done over there is just ridiculous and should, someone should have to pay the price for all the weakness and lying and guilt and, you know. Yeah, and then the, the second incident was she laid down and she like kind of like tried to cuddle with me and put her hand on my chest and I rolled up and then ended up getting her, putting her in a headlock and just started punching her in her face and she just repeatedly until I woke up. Thank you for serving. Anytime, anywhere. Uh, I'm Michelle. 